The Lord be with you. Good morning. Welcome again to worship on this Lord's Day. So glad to have you joining us and glad to have you participating with us as well. I want to get a few announcements out of the way before we begin our worship service. This afternoon at 3 o'clock, 3 to 5, we are hosting in our parking lot a drive through Fall Fest. Uh, we have a number of wonderful volunteers that will be passing out safely at a distance, uh, goodies and um, various activities and things to do. So please plan to come and join us this afternoon for that. Next Sunday, the first Sunday of November, we will uh, be marking All Saints Day and it will be a communion service. We will name all of our faithful folk who have passed away this past year. We will uh, have them represented by a lit candle and we'll mark their name with the ringing of a gong. Uh, it's a very meaningful uh, and moving service. If you have someone in your family or in your immediate close circle of friends who you would like to have named, uh, please call the church office or email uh, the church office and give that name and we'll be sure to include them. Uh, the Black Lives Matter vigil continues on the square from 12 to 1. And this coming Wednesday, 28 October, marks the 150th consecutive day. So I do hope we will have a good crowd out to mark that important anniversary. Amy Backstrom, our Director of Family Ministries, continues to offer several uh, Bible studies and uh, prayer uh, events, and you can find out all about them by going to our website, that's firstpresworcester, all one word, dot org, and you'll find the listings there and the times to uh, join by Zoom. And finally, today we are graced to welcome and to be led in worship throughout our service uh, by Michael and Rachel Ludwig and their children. The Ludwigs are our mission partners in Niger, and I know that you will uh, enjoy hearing from them. Uh, their children do some participation, particularly at the beginning of the worship service, and then some uh, very uh, moving and, um, and stimulating and inspiring messages that will come then uh, as the service goes on. Let us now prepare our hearts to worship God. Good morning. As I was rehearsing today's music and trying to decide what to say to you this morning, I actually thought of the chorus of an English Christmas carol. So with that in mind, I bring you two tidings of comfort and one of joy. Our three composers are all British composers of the 20th and 21st centuries. First of all, an aria by Noel Rosthorne. Mr. Rosthorne served at Liverpool Cathedral for 25 years and died in 2019. Our musical offering today is In Green Pastures, a reference to Psalm 23 by the Brit Harold Dark. Dark actually served at St. Michael's Cornhill in London for 50 years with a short break during World War II when he served at King's College, Cambridge. He's perhaps best known for his choral works, especially his beautiful setting of In the Bleak Midwinter. Finally, the postlude is a joyful piece by C.S. Lang. He was born in New Zealand, but spent his life in England. He actually spent most of his career at the Christ Hospital School in West Sussex. And an interesting side note about that particular institution, that's where the Westminster Abbey Choir Boys spent World War II as part of that choir, out of the danger of London. The title of the postlude deserves a little bit of explanation. It's called a tuba tune. And the reason for that is that in an early 20th century British organ, the loudest and, and broadest stop on the organ, solo stop on the organ, was not a trumpet, but a tuba. And while we don't have a tuba here at First Pres, we do have a wonderful trumpet and cornet that when used together, make a very good accounting of themselves. Thank you.
sister. We're sorry that we can't see you in person this morning. And that we can't visit all our parents' old stomping grounds from college. But we are happy to bring you greetings from our friends in Niger. We want to pass on warm greetings from the Evangelical Church in the Republic of Niger, who wants you to know that they are praying for you in the uncertain time of this pandemic. In Niger now, they aren't dealing with COVID-19 issues anymore, but they are dealing with big flooding, with mud brick houses falling in, with insecure elections that are coming up, and with some other security issues across the country. So we ask that you continue to keep us in your prayers, please. Greetings from Niger. We're the Ludwig family. Do you like superfood? Well, this is the superfood we grow in Niger. It's called moringa. Moringa grows on little trees like this. Oh, big trees like this. Moringa has protein, vitamin C, and calcium. <laughs> and you can grow it without much water. But we are helping people grow it quickly with lots of uh, reused water and uh, fertilizer from fish that uh, they can grow at the same time. As the kids said, we live in Niger, working with our partners in the Evangelical Church of Niger to train leaders for community transformation. We use a strategy called Community Health Evangelism, or CHE, to train pastors who are often isolated in villages in a 99% Muslim society. The main idea of CHE for us is to find simple things pastors can do, like this hand washing station, to help with problems they identify in their communities. Then to allow those simple teachings to naturally pave the way for relationships that better Muslim-Christian relations, as well as open people to hearing the fullness of the good news the pastor has to share. Niger is ranked by the UN as the least developed country in the world, so despite the joyfulness and strong community of people, there are lots of difficulties they deal with. In our fourth year of CHE training, we're doing a much wider variety of things and going to visit four different regions of the country. We've had large trainings to introduce the CHE ideas of self-development and preventing common problems, like the common complications in pregnancy, as we're shown here teaching pastors to recognize the eight most common danger signs for pregnant women. At another training, we taught how to make latrines in a way that can motivate people to build their own. The idea here is to plant a fruit tree as soon as this basic latrine is filled up, since it gets filled with rich organic fertilizer that will help the tree grow quickly. This year, we're also focusing on raising up regional trainers who have taken more leadership in our trainings. They're shown here teaching about action-oriented Bible study and teaching not to carry people because of the necessity of community ownership in order to get real progress and economic development. We've had a wide variety of worship experiences lately, so we'd like to share a bit of each with you. Worship takes many forms, but here a major emphasis is offering something to God as thanks. From a special Women's Sunday you saw at the beginning, to Christmas when the children processed in with offerings, to even now worshiping at home with only our guards family due to the coronavirus precautions. Through it all, God is praised in many different ways. It's been a roller coaster finishing up school and getting back to the U.S. for our youngest son's hip surgery, but we're so thankful to be well cared for and to have a chance to share more with churches now. As we close, we'd like to thank you for your continued support and prayers and ask that you pray for the EERN Church and the Che Evangelists during this time. Matthew chapter 22 verses 34 through 46. The Bible has a lot to say about love. 
It tells you God loves you. It tells you that God wants you to love him. It tells you to love your neighbor. There is so much in the Bible about love that some people call it a love letter. A long time ago, when Jesus was on earth, people thought the Bible was just about rules. Do this, don't do that, say this, wear that, go here, worship here, rule after rule after rule. There was a little bit about love, a lot about rules. The rules were all people seemed to care about, but love was all Jesus cared about. He came here to show each one of us just how much he loves us. He loves us so much that he even died for our sins so we can live with him forever and always. There were a whole bunch of people who really liked Jesus' message of love, but there were also a bunch of people who really liked the rules. They thought following the rules was all that mattered, but they forgot that everyone makes mistakes sometimes and disobeys those rules. And then what? Is that it? One broken rule and it's all over? No way. Jesus came so that even when we make mistakes, he can save us. It's such an amazing way to show just how much he loves us. One day, the rule followers wanted to know what Jesus thought was the most important one of all. We could only ever follow one single rule. Which one would it be? They expected Jesus to say one of the Ten Commandments, like obeying your parents or keeping the Sabbath a day only for God. But Jesus had an even better one, the best rule of all, and it's all about love. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself, and the law of the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus turned all of those rules into just two simple ones. Love God and love others. Every single other rule can fit into one of those two. It is so simple. Everyone could just use a little more love. Hi, everybody. How many of you know the story called No David? That used to be a fan favorite of my kids, and I looked all over my house and I couldn't find it. But it, it's a book about a little boy named David, and he goes through his house and he gets in trouble all the time. He fills the bathtub up with too much water. He's just making messes all over the house, and constantly his mom is saying, No, David, don't fill up the water. No, David, you can't climb up on the furniture. No, David, you can't toss the books all over the floor. No, no, no. And he's getting in trouble all day long. Have we ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like there are just days and times where you just cannot do anything right? Maybe you get a couple bad grades in school, or you just can't figure out the math problem, or you just don't like the book and you're falling behind in your reading class. Sometimes we just have those days. But do you know what? God doesn't care. God doesn't care. He, at the end of the No David book, he's, David is sad and he's lonely and he's feeling so frustrated and defeated. And he runs up to his mom and she says, yes, David, I love you. After all the bad things that he's done, all the no, no, no's, he runs into the arms of his mom and she says, yes, David, I love you. Just like God, just like all those times that we just feel defeated and that we can't do anything right, we can always run into the arms of God. The love and the embrace is always there no matter what happens, no matter what we do, good or bad. He erases all of those things. He closes the book and says, yes, I love you. It doesn't matter. So on those days that we're having a bad day, that we didn't do good on our math test, that we failed the social studies test, that we hate going to school because it's all online and we miss our friends, that we're grumpy about missing sports, that we're grumpy about missing birthdays and all of those things that make us feel bad. And we're just not having a good day. Remember that God's loving arms are always there no matter what happens to us throughout the day. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your constant love, 
your open arms at the end of a bad day to say, yes, I do love you, children of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let us bring our thoughts and our concerns, our joys and our thanksgivings, and let's turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the author and giver of all good things. We thank you for all your gifts and your grace. We thank you for creating us and for all that is, for food, for clothes, for shelter, and people who love us unconditionally. For time, money, and resources to share, for your mercies in special situations, we give you thanks. And so we thank you for the grace and the love that you have shown us in sending your son Jesus to live for us and die for us and rise again for us. We ask that you would help us to love and serve others as you have loved and served us in Jesus Christ. Develop in us hearts that would long to worship and honor you more than we focus on our own selfish wants and desires. O oh Lord, we pray that the comfort and healing of your Holy Spirit would be felt by all those who are in pain in mind and body or spirit this day. Help them to know that you are with them and you are able to carry them through their struggles. Lord, we pray for your love to be known in the country of Niger. We pray that you would help the people there in their struggles with flooding, with hunger, with political and safety threats. We also pray that you would be with our First Presbyterian Church family here, our community, be with it, nurture it. And we pray for communities around us that are riddled with fear and those that are plagued by systemic oppression. Move with your spirit to bring help and justice and move us to be agents of your change. Bless and uphold them, Lord, and us so that we may live to make your love clear in the world around us. For we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Next, I'd like us to turn to our scripture reading for today. And first, let us turn our hearts to God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord of life, we thank you for all your good gifts, especially for the gift of your word. We pray now that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts and minds to know and to understand that we may turn to you and in turning to you, we may experience your abundant life. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Bodies, sacrifice, renewal, worship. What is this passage about? Someone recently sent me a Saturday Night Live video, which was a skit about the hilarity of a church trying to worship together over the internet on Zoom. After much funniness about no one listening to the pastor and no one following the correct video call etiquette, eventually the pastor suddenly has this brilliant inspiration. He shouts out above all the noise from individual households, God has a message for you. And so everyone is quiet. Then he continues, God wants you to go to the top right corner of your screen and click on the little microphone button to make a red slash go through it. So now, with everyone muted correctly, the pastor can go on with the rest of the service in peace. Although he's a little disturbed that he can no longer get an amen from anybody anymore. Whether you've been in a real-life video conference meeting like that or not, in some way that skit is still true to life on a larger scale for us. Don't we all want a message from God that makes it all clear on how we can live in peace and harmony? Don't you want to know for sure what it is that God wants you to do? Don't you want to get your life organized so that you can get the best out of it? Well, I think that's something of what this scripture passage has for us today. The center of this passage is about offering our life in real ways so that we can be shaped to live in line with God's mercy. It's important to note that just before in this passage, Paul has been emphasizing that God's mercy and grace are a free gift. And that God's mercy specifically is something that none of us has earned, and it's not the result of giving or of our doing good. Because of that gift, though, or by the power of that gift, we're encouraged to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. That is quite heavy with meaning. What does it mean to give ourselves as a living sacrifice? 
There's a lot of baggage to sort through about the meaning of sacrifice in the ancient world and then the modern meaning. But when you boil it down, offering a living sacrifice expresses the idea of giving real parts of yourself. If not your physical body, it still stands for giving yourself in genuine ways, in vibrant, life-filled ways, in tangible, meaningful ways. Ways that go beyond the generic and the socially expected. So we're actually giving in a living way, not in a dead or a lifeless or a false expression of ourselves way. That sounds like a deep and complicated kind of worship, doesn't it? Along with our self-offering, we're urged not to conform to the world and not to put the bar just at what is socially acceptable or convenient. Instead, we should allow our minds to be transformed by renewing them. But how do we renew our minds? What can we put our minds through that refocuses them in the right way? I think that's the same as asking, what is it that orients our minds toward God again and again? And then the further question that comes to me immediately is, is the renewing and the reorienting related to offering our bodies as living sacrifices? For Paul, is it carrying out our spiritual worship that then points us to this renewing of our minds? I think there is a connection that meaningful and significant offering to the Lord is what renews us and reorients us. It keeps us pointing back to the goodness and the grace that God is continually showering upon us. Well, then in the rest of the passage, we see that we all have special gifts that God has given us, even though they may be different gifts. But they should all be used for helping the other parts of our communal body, the brothers and sisters that we've been connected to through Christ. Then viewing this all together in this passage, it's the self-offering, the renewing, and the sharing those are the things that help us to know God's will, and then that help us live in harmony with God's peace and mercy and his purpose for our lives. If that's the heart of our passage, not being shaped into the image of the world, but having real worship shape us into a life that follows after God's purpose and mercy, then it makes me ask myself, what has been shaping my life? Is worship something that has shaped my life? Or is it just something that I do once a week because it's what good Christians do? It's a time to reconnect with friends and community. When I look back at my life, I see how worshiping with other Christians really has shaped my life. The weekly responses and songs that my church said and sang as a child really did get deep inside me so much that I find them bubbling out occasionally in surprising times. And when I was in college, the worship of my fellowship group, I know it really shaped my faith at an important time. In some ways, that was the first time that I remember seeing people actually excited about going to worship, being passionate, being vulnerable, and seeming to sing about things that felt like they were real. But it was also seeing other Christians live the same way that they worshipped that sealed the deal for me and moved me into a different direction. Helping me go from someone who just kind of grew up going to church to someone who really wanted to become more faithful and wanted to be committed to living out what I believed. And so for me, I think it's just like what one of my old Little League coaches used to say. He used to say, you play like you practice. It's kind of hard for us to sometimes see how worship shapes our lives, but it can be easier to see how worship is shaped in a negative way by the practices of our lives. 
On this side of the analogy, we practice a certain lifestyle, a certain style of living in our internet age with everything on demand and being able to be tailored to our desired experience. So that's how we feel most comfortable when we come to this big arena of corporate worship, ready for it all to be tailored to our comfort. Well, back to the other side of the analogy, you play like you practice. I think we underestimate the force of how our practice of worship can affect the way that we play out our lives. I see it powerfully in the Christians that I live with in the country of Niger, or Niger, as we say it in the French pronunciation. For them, they have a culture of worship that is much stronger on the idea that you go to worship in order to offer something to God. You can plainly see this idea in how much emphasis they put on individuals or various groups preparing a song every week to sing specially in the worship service. So the first hour of worship is individuals or groups offering a song that they prepared during the week. As a response to these songs, as they're offered, other people will line up to put money in the offering baskets during those songs. But secondly, I've also seen this idea through the various skits that they've done about the importance of going to church. Several skits have given the idea that you can't imagine not going to church because church is where you offer yourself to God. The added benefit they proclaim is that people who are practicing offering themselves to God at church are then more used to and more quick to offering themselves to the needs of others. So we come to church to offer ourselves to God together and learn to offer ourselves to our families and our communities instead of keeping to ourselves and being oriented toward our own wants and our own interests. I have to admit that sometimes it's been hard for me to always get something from worship services in Niger, especially when they're three hours long and in a language that I barely understood for many years. But it has been clear to me to see how the way that my Nigerian friends offer themselves in worship is part of the training that helps them to be so open and so offering to people in need. If we come back to my coach who would say, you play like you practice, I want to suggest that our scripture passage is pushing back on us to think about how worship affects our lives. You live like you worship. Often we see our Sunday worship services as the culmination of things in a week. All the work that went into planning a service or practicing the music or recording it or uploading it. All, we also bring all that happened with us in the week to worship. All the thoughts, all the frustrations and the needs and the praises, all that have built up throughout the week, we bring them here. And just maybe we also half consciously treat it like a spiritual wash day at the end of our week. All the sins that we've built up, we come to have them forgiven, to have them washed away, or to balance them out by doing the good work of attending worship. This passage of Paul's pushes us, however, to think of it the other way. You live like you worship. We're called to continue to offer ourselves to God as a living, genuine, open offering. This is what renews our minds and starts to transform us to be in line with God's mercy. In taking this approach, then it's better for us to see our Sunday worship as the beginning, the beginning of our practice of offering our lives to God. It's a way to start off the week with the practice of being renewed and formed in lifestyles that God wants us to have. Of course, it's obvious that our lives don't just suddenly become in line with God's will, 
but they can be formed that way by practicing offering ourselves in worship and then continuing that practice throughout the week, by practicing confession and forgiveness in worship and then throughout the week, by practicing meditating on scriptures in worship and then throughout the week, by practicing blessing people as they leave us in worship and throughout the week. I've seen and am convinced of this. If we truly offer ourselves into the worship that we're a part of and into the things that we repeat in our worship services, then our lives will be transformed by them and we will continue to play the rest of our lives like we've been practicing in worship. The trick is often having investment in what we're doing in worship. Being able to have a clear enough focus to get around all the distractions and center on what, how what we're doing in worship is really connected to us individually and corporately. I want to give a last comparison about offering from my work in Niger as a community health evangelism trainer. We abbreviate that CHE. In this work, I see how the regular practice of offering ourselves becomes transformational when it bleeds over into our everyday lives. What I love about Che teaching is that it teaches practical ways of community development, shooting for whole community transformation. A central part of our teaching is following through a story that helps people to look at the needs of their community. Then everyone is given a role in selecting the most important needs. And finally, everyone is challenged to offer themselves and what they have to help with these needs that are important to them. Through this process of trying to get community members involved in self-development, it becomes obvious that a key element is for many people to routinely reflect on what they can and should offer to others. That is an important piece of what brings transformation in a community. Well, to sum up this whole idea, I think Paul is pointing us to the renewal of our minds, which takes regular practice through offering ourselves to God in worship. As Mia Hamm, the U.S. women's soccer icon, liked to say, I am building a fire and every day that I train, I'm adding more fuel. At just the right moment, I light the match. We are building that fire as we practice worship where we really offer a part of ourselves. It prepares us to be caught up in the Holy Spirit's flame, pulling us into place so that we can help others, so that we can meet the needs of the world as we offer ourselves. All of this is in response to the amazing grace that has already met our most important needs. So what's the takeaway from all of this? I'd like to give you three things, something to think about, something to pray about, and something to do. So let's think, what part of worship do you see yourself taking with you in the coming week? And let's pray. Pray for the renewing of your mind and to see what you should offer to others this week. And let's do. Let's practice offering some part of ourselves to God every day. With those things in mind, let us take another moment for prayer. Will you please pray with me? O oh God, we know that we are not able to do it on our own, and so you must be the one that empowers us. We also trust that we are really and ultimately yours. So we rely on you to be the one who shows us the way, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
And now, as we go from this gathered space, may we remember to offer ourselves to God throughout the week. May we live like we worship. And as we go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and always. Amen.